Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Bridget, Mark, and IF for inviting me. Um, my name is Chris Buttonham, and I'm the founder of Obi. Obi uh, is a software startup, and we built a tool that enables teams to uh, create a faster self-service support system um, for their team. So what that means is uh, mostly client-facing teams will leverage Obi to find the things they need to do their job faster. So um, whether that's sales collateral, answers to common questions, product documentation, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I am going to talk uh, about founder-led growth today is sort of my take on the an homage to the product-led growth uh, mantra that's been going around. Um, and, you know, basically, instead of telling you how to do things, I'm just going to go through my story, tell you what I did, what I learned, um, what's worked and what's what hasn't. Um, and then from there, um, I'm hopefully going to make it conversational and I'm happy to answer as many questions as, as humanly possible. Um, I don't know if, yeah, let's, uh, let's just dig right in. So just a little bit about me, um, just to give you an idea of uh, why you should or should not listen to me. Um, I re registered my first business when I was 15 years old. I'm very much a born and bred entrepreneur, uh, one of those crazy breeds that doesn't really know how to do anything else. Um, I launched a digital market, marketing agency while I was in university. I went to McMaster uh, University um, and I focused a little bit too much on that rather than my studies, but barely uh, graduated in 2013. Um, in 2015, I started a company called OneBase um, and through a few pivots, uh, that company has become uh, OB today. In 2017, I moved to California for the 500 Startups Accelerator Program and the Plug and Play Accelerator Program. Um, I did come back in between, but I am here now um, in Silicon Valley. Um, but in 2019, I closed um, a million dollar round from investors and then officially moved down here and opened our US office. And then of course, 2020, we, we, don't, we don't speak about. Um, and I always like to, I've done a few, um, different talks like this, and I always like to just tell you broadly what I can help with in case I can be helpful. You can feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm a, as well as a self-taught salesperson, I am a, uh, self-taught product designer. Um, I'm also, uh, heavily focused on startup culture. Um, I know a little bit of what to do with uh, startup fundraising, but a lot of what not to do. So I can help with that as well. Um, and then I'm always a, an advocate for founder um, mental health and, and well-being, which is uh, really uh, uh, an important topic. So let me just dig right into it. Um, as I said, I'm going to just basically tell my story anecdotally um, and talk about some of the, the tools and strategies that uh, we've used over, over the last five years building this company. I um, mean, at the end, we'll save some uh, good time for, for questions, hopefully. So when we first launched this company, we launched, it was called OneBase, and um, we built this software basically that was aimed at uh, training employees, uh, onboarding employees. And it was very much uh, just throwing lipstick on a pig. It was a, um, uh, just a new version of, of a lot of software that already existed out there. Um, and one of the first mistakes that we made was not listening to our mentors and people like Innovation Factory telling us that we should probably validate this idea before going head first into it, but that's not fun. Uh, because it's not building product. Um, and so I like to talk about getting our first customer. I think it was probably six months in, uh, six to eight months into starting the company. This was very much through brute force. It was cold calling. So I have experience doing that. Um, networking, uh, pitching. I did lots of different local pitch competitions. And anytime I had a chance to talk about uh, one base I did um, and and I was not good at any of it um, but I think what was great was just 
getting, uh, you know, kicking off the tires, um, getting used to talking about the, the product that we were trying to sell um, and learning what resonated and what didn't. The first sale was very much uh, closed, sort of old school. It was like a boardroom meeting. I think actually we rented at the Innovation Factory boardroom. I just made up a price for it because we hadn't sold it before. I think it was a few thousand dollars. Um, and, and we ended up selling our first subscription to, uh, to, to this product called OneBase. And uh, this is a, an image of me and my co-founder uh, starting at the sort of first iteration of, of the forge in Hamilton, uh, holding our OneBase sign. From there, um, the second company, cu customer was equally as difficult uh, to close and maintain, um, but very different in nature. So um, we sort of learned at that point that the cold calling, at least in, in the current iteration of the product, wasn't working. A lot of those grassroots um, sort of outbound techniques weren't working for our type of software. Um, and this is when I think I was working with a couple of sales mentors at the time. I sort of discovered this idea of bravado and I started over promising and under delivering, um, which is not a good formula for success. Um, but this is when we actually started to leverage a different uh, growth channel for um, acquiring customers. And we were using things like product hunts, a lot of the free startup uh, esque tools. Um, and that was good. Cause again, it was more data. It was, it was getting us to validate our idea. Um, but at the same time, it was, so we were still on this waterfall product development, um, nightmare where we were building without validating. We had feature creep. We really did not have any product market fit whatsoever. Um, and we, we're so excited at the idea of real customers that we just lost sight of the bigger picture. Um, and so that, that second customer actually came through one of these free channels. They reached out to us on our website um, and, and uh, we ended up closing the deal uh, just through a first sort of discovery call type, um, uh, type acquisition. Um, so we, we, we changed the name and pivoted the company uh, three times. And so from one base, it was tacit. Um, and uh, this was our first product hunt launch um, back in, I think, 20, 2016. So early on leveraging free channels of distribution, it, it very, very much, it, again, it depends on what industry you're, you're in. For us, we were in sort of this B2B software, very much we were targeting a bottoms up approach, organic inbound was sort of what we were aiming for. And so channels like Product Hunt, um, there's also like Indie Hackers and some of these communities. If you build in the open, a lot of times if you're um, building software like this, it's a really great way to get your first users and get some feedback. So then um, we realized struggling to, to really gain any um, uh, proper traction with these, this iteration uh, of the product in the company, um, we decided to pivot. Um, so I won't talk too much about the product. Obviously we can, we can talk about that, um, at the end if you would like, but we, we pivoted away from this idea of creating, um, a employee onboarding system, um, into something a little bit more unique. So that was a, a little bit more closer to sort of a commodity and what we pivoted into, which is Obi today, was taking knowledge that organizations already had and delivering it in places that they already work. And so for context, our product is, is bolted into Slack. Hopefully everybody knows what Slack is at this point. Um, and the reason that's important is Slack, um, was and, and continues to be an incredible channel um, of distribution for us. And so this has been um, something that I've learned a lot about over the years is uh, free channels of distribution and partner marketing. And so um, once integrating our new product, Obi, into Slack, we began to really understand what um, a good channel partner relationship 
look like um, and, and leveraging that for uh, scale. Um, now, it's important to note bef before we did that, we, when pivoting into OB, we really validated the idea um, and learned from our, our mistakes early on. So um, something that I will always advocate for is use a landing page strategy. There's a lot of free tools out there. I'm sure that it's changed a lot since we've sort of uh, done that uh, grassroots approach, but there's like unbounce and things like that. So if you have an idea, um, whether it's a pivot of your current product or maybe you're early enough where you're still in that stage, you know, throw up a landing page, um, put a, an email capture and, and, and try out some value propositions, some messaging and see if users even care. Um, just to give you an idea of, the sort of magnitude that we were dealing with when we were building one base and then pivoting into or changing the name into tacit i think we maybe had 500 users total over the year and a half that we were spinning our wheels on that and like i said i think we only ever acquired a handful of customers maybe three or four customers um, and when we decided it was time to pivot it wasn't working we whipped up this landing page for this, this OB thing, which was going to deliver your knowledge that you had in Google Drive into Slack. Um, we put up this landing page and I think we had 500 uh, emails of people that were interested in the beta um, before we had even written a line of code or anything. So that was a really good indication that we were at least on a better, uh, better track of, of what, was, what, was, what we should be doing. Um, from there, we leveraged what Slack calls their app directory. So we were very early. It helps to be early. Um, again, we probably didn't know it at the time, but learning from our mistakes um, and pivoting into something that resonated more with users, we knew that um, you know doubling down on a on a channel strategy was actually going to be more effective for us. So. Um, we have consistently been featured in their app directory um, because we were in there so early on um, and have created a relationship with Slack. And that is something that companies uh, coming into the Slack app directory today are, are fighting an uphill battle with. And so it, it's really, it pays to be early um, and it pays to really build relationships where we rank between the top 10, top 20, apps in all of our categories. And this still today drives uh, more than 50% of our qualified inbound leads uh, that we end up closing. Um, Slack is our biggest channel, but the way OB works is by connecting to existing knowledge sources. So things like Google Drive, Atlassian's Confluence, Jira, Dropbox, Box, that sort of thing. And so what's unique about that um, is we now have channel partners with all of those different vendors and all of those different vendors have the ability to drive leads to uh, to our business. So just thinking about what partnerships you can make, what integrations you can do, that's software or hardware um, that could actually turn into a channel of distribution for you is a great way to get free qualified inbound traffic. And I can obviously talk about the semantics of how we've run those partnerships over time. So after we launched OB, we did decide to use a freemium approach. Um, and I have strong opinions loosely held on freemium and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this is really when we were starting to grow up. So uh, we learned what value-based priced ba uh, value -based pricing was um, while leveraging our inbound growth. So um, with Slack being our, our main distribution partner uh, and being so early and having a really great value proposition that we were tweaking and learning through our, our landing page strategy, we were able to acquire over, I think, 8,000 different companies um, to use our product for free. This was spanning across hundreds of thousands of users at the time. Um, and so we knew that this channel was a really great uh, channel for user acquisition. Um, but we still didn't know what people were willing to pay for it. And that was 
um, you know, a blessing and a curse. The the amount of companies and users that were using OB was good. It, it did give us a certain sense of validation. This is actually when we were accepted into the 500 startups program and, and raised our first round of investor financing. But um, it was detrimental. We, we, we wasted too much time trying to figure out what customers were willing to pay for. And right around the end of 2018, I believe, uh, we decided, we made the really difficult decision to just completely shut off our freemium plan. And doing so was the most impactful thing we've done with the entire uh, company. And, and again, I'm, I'm willing to um, sort of answer questions on that and dig into it deeper. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you shouldn't try freemium. So we we'll give a little quick little story. One of my friends is the founder of a company called Loom, and I, I think they have millions of users now. Um, and they have been very successful with a freemium model. And I think it really comes down to, uh, can you leverage the land grab well enough? Do you really know what people are going to be willing to pay for? Um, and so you have to really figure out if it's right for your business. And I think it's, it's fine to try, but don't make the mistake that I made um, by waiting too long to shut it off if it's not working. I think uh, and a macro um, uh, thing that I've learned is just make decisions faster, no matter what they are, um, uh, and learn from, from uh, the data and, and the mistakes you're making along the way. <clears throat> so from um, turning off the freemium um, to really reaching product market fit, I hope everyone understands at least loosely what that concept means. Um, this is when we really started building um, a sales funnel. We got our positioning right, which was also, uh, it's also it's such an undervalued exercise. And again, I, I don't 100% know what the, the makeup of the attendees are at, at the moment. Um, but if you're early stage, chances are you don't have product market fit or you have a semblance of product market fit um, and really trying to figure that out and get positioning that goes deep on certain verticals and people that really, really need your product like hair on fire problem versus nice to have is going to change your entire growth strategy, your entire sales funnel. And I, it sounds obvious, um, but each time we go through this exercise, we move the needle so much more than um, all of the other, you know, surface value things that you could, you could possibly do. Um, so in this, this stage is really where um, I had to start getting good at selling. So basically the way we built our funnel is um, now we had no free. What we did is we decided that you had to talk to us on the phone before you could use our product. And that was the single greatest thing that we ever did. And I recommend it for any and all types of companies. Um, it might not scale, it might not necessarily be uh, what works for your business, but I can assure you, you're going to learn a lot. So what we did is we basically, you know, created a book a call or book a demo link on our website. Um, we allowed bookings via Calendly. Um, through that Calendly booking, we we collected a bunch of data that we weren't collecting before. And, and those free users that were eating up our time and eating up our roadmap, asking for things that they were never going to pay for, we were not going to do that again. So we were capturing, you know, what size of organization, what role are you, uh, what team, um, that sort of thing. After we got the calls booked, I was using just a standard uh, Bant sales discovery call framework. So budget authority needs timeline. Um, you can just Google that if you don't already know it. Um, there's a lot of different schools of thought on that. Uh, there's different frameworks. That's the one that works for me. And again, I, I don't have any formal sales training or anything like that. Um, but by just talking to people and, and getting your feet wet, you'll, you'll learn what works and, and what doesn't. 
Um, from there, I would do sort of a pitch and demo. Um, this calls about 30 minutes. Um, and then it followed by um, sort of an email cadence uh, afterwards um, to try and get the get the close of the customer. A lot of what worked for us in this stage is streamlining that. So using tools like Calendly, using a proper CRM, um, using proper documentation, streamlining a lot of the procurement side. So again, all of this is going to be dependent on on your own company. Maybe you're not a B2B software company, maybe you're a consumer product, um, something like that. But for us, um, a lot of the bottlenecks in our sales process were convincing them that our product was secure, um, getting the right legal documentation. So um, one of the things that I'm gonna share after the call is uh, the YC SaaS agreement. That's been super helpful for us. It's just a standard like master service agreement. So getting your ducks in a row in terms of how am I going to make this process replicable? It doesn't have to be replicable right away, but you'll learn the questions that people are asking and learn to handle objections uh, as you continue through this process. So this is uh, just a look at our, our CRM, our funnel. Um, I use Streak CRM. It's not the most popular, um, but what I really like about Streak um, is that it's built right into Gmail. So it's a great tool. It's actually a Canadian company and um, uh, phenomenal tooling. They have uh, email snippets so you can save like my whole follow-up cadence with prospects um, is all pre-built and I just click a couple buttons to send pre-designed emails to my prospects. Makes everything a lot easier, particularly if you're a team of one or two or three, um, just starting in your sales journey and just trying to figure this out. Um, makes it a lot easier to keep everything organized. And again, I can talk more tactics um, in the Q&A section as well. Now, <clears throat> this is sort of where we're, this, the stage we're at or wrapping up right now is from product market fit to scale. So for us, it really was, has been optimizing our funnel. So how do we remove friction from people booking a call. So we've learned that for us, people booking a call is the best way to, uh, to gain a customer's, uh, gain a customer. Once we get somebody to, to click that link and, and finally book a call with us, we have upwards of a 35 to 40% close rate, which is pretty unheard of. It, it's a really great close rate. Um, our issue is the top of the funnel. So getting more of those in, uh, We've tried the whole free trial thing. And obviously I talked about freemium. And so it's really about testing, 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 experimentation, um, and figuring out what's right for your business. And once you do figure out something that, that works, double down on it. Don't think you need to reinvent the wheel. Work on what's working first. Um, and so again, for us, that's optimizing that funnel. So we use tools like Hotjar, we use tools like Google Optimize, um, and there's a bunch of other A-B testing type tools that you can put on your website and you can learn, okay, how many times are people clicking on that link? How long did it take them to get there? Is Does it appear that there's confusion once they hit your pricing page? Um, how many clicks does it take to get them to book a call? What's the cost benefit analysis of, I need the, I need the user's um, job role, or I need them to explicitly tell me the company's name when I can maybe infer that from the email. Let's save let's save them a click in an input field and get and and reduce the friction in getting a call book. So it's uh, it's quite a difficult and arduous process, but testing, testing, testing um, has been just huge for us. Um, and one of the the tools in my list of tools and strategies to, to give to you guys after is um, uh, experiment documentation. So I can send a template, um, I can give it to Bridget uh, afterwards, but it's one of those things you have to get into a habit of, it's not necessarily fun, but we created um, with uh, one of my employees, a growth experiment framework where basically we're creating anything we do. So whether it's changing the color of a button 
or adding a new field in our, our customer acquisition funnel, we create an experiment doc for. And what that means is we created a hypothesis. So by changing the color of this button, I anticipate we're going to increase our inbound leads by 2%. Um, and by doing so, it really keeps you honest on how you're tracking um, those efforts. What is required to get those efforts done? Does it require my developer? Can I do this with tools that are self-serve on my own? Um, and then you can go back and you can look at the results and say, oh, wow, I was really off of my hypothesis. But here I learned this component. And by learning this component, I'm, this is going to um, help me understand where I need to go next uh, with, uh, with future experiments. So Chris, may that, I interrupt? Please, First, please do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have a question. And so I thought since we're right on the topic, uh, it was mm -hmm. timely. So somebody, mm -hmm. Ryan O'Grady is asking, who delivers the online demo in your company? <laughs> Mostly me still. Um, okay. There's two of us that do it. Um, and I think that that's actually a great question because um, for a lot of early stage companies, it really should be the founder. You know the company best. Um, and you just have to be careful that it's not, the process isn't so siloed with you that you can't replicate it. I've heard a lot of horror stories of companies not being able to get out of that, that founder sales um, process. Um, be it that we're a knowledge management company, I've been sort of documenting since day one. And so it's been easier to transition this off to um, folks that I hire to help with this. Um, but uh, it is important in the early days that the founder knows how to how to sell. Um, I'm sure I'm sure that that's obvious. But yeah, still today I do I do a lot of them, less and less as as time goes on. But I still do a lot of them. Okay, great. Thanks for the question, Ryan. Yes, thank you, Ryan. So um, that's sort of uh, some of the learnings from optimizing our funnel. Some of the things that. Uh, we've been working on that's worked and I've, and I've probably tried every single growth strategy in the book. So again, I can talk more about each and every one of them. Um, something that's really working well for us right now is content and SEO. This is a long game. I'm sure uh, Mark has a lot of experience with this as well. Um, it's not always the most obvious uh, or fun strategy for startups to, um, to take on because it's very time consuming and the, the payoff often takes longer. Sometimes you get lucky if you find a really unique um, section of green space where you can create some interesting content. Um, but uh, it is free. So uh, aside from your time, of course. So that's a really great uh, strategy to try. Um, one of the just quick tactics I'd like to share is we made the, the, the uh, mistake of creating our blog on medium to begin with and that we obviously later learned that that's not great for seo um, it only helps medium so we we recently or not recently a couple of years ago brought uh, our blog onto wordpress onto our own domain it's a huge you just got to do it um we've tried retargeting and some other paid acquisition via our content so if you land on one of our blogs through keywords we will then take that as an indication that you have some um, uh, qualification in our realm and we will retarget to you. What LinkedIn works for us, it's quite expensive, but um, that's a strategy that works for us. We, we've tried Facebook and Instagram, not as much just for our demographic. Um, and we also uh, have been fairly successful with uh, Google AdWords, um, specifically targeting uh, competitors products. So with us again, very specific, uh, story, but we're a B2B SaaS company. So ensuring that OB is around when our prospective customers are evaluating other solutions is really important. A lot of our competitors are a lot more well-funded than us. Um, and so riding their coattails is just a necessary evil and it's, it's been successful. Um, for different companies, like maybe your consumer or, or maybe your earlier stage, um, even B2B community building is extremely um, 
uh, effective if you can do it right. I mentioned indie hackers before, um, and there's all kinds of different communities. There's probably different communities for your business. Reddit has a lot of great communities and things like that. So I would encourage you to, um, to look into those as well. Just to give you some proof to what I'm saying, um, this is a 12 month average of our um, uh, search con console impressions. So we crossed the million mark in terms of search impressions with OB and our, our SEO growth is growing so fast that we will do uh, our next million in half that time um, at least. So you'll see like we really only started our, our content strategy um, at the end of 2019. And it took a while before we started seeing any meaningful results. Um, so stay the course and, and, and try and add value with content you're building. And then I just wanted to talk about what the next frontier for Obi looks like. Um, so given that we have figured out product market fit and we sort of know how to close customers um, and we're starting to figure out how to take $1 and turn it into two, meaning we know what channels and uh, from marketing and growth that are we can invest in to get more leads, uh, the strategy for us uh, will likely be hiring sort of BDR, SDR, AE model, bringing in more salespeople like me to close our inbound leads is, is, is mostly, I think, what we're going to be doing. Uh, and then again, just doubling down on those inbound marketing channels, uh, like our content strategy, like our retargeting and some of our paid acquisition efforts that, uh, that are, are working for us. Chris, uh, just to interrupt yeah. you again, uh, Ryan Please. had a follow-up question. Uh, so just while we're still on this topic, uh, so Ryan just had a follow-up question to his one before. Um, as a founder, uh, I still deliver demos too. And as a follow-up question, I would be interested to know the strategy or plan on transitioning from founder delivering, delivering the demo to other team members. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so I've done this um, partially. Um, again, I think being a knowledge management company, I think we have uh, a bit of an advantage, quite frankly. I think across the board, not just sales, but definitely sales. Uh, if you're not documenting your processes, um, you're going to have a really hard time transitioning um, anyone. Um, you can use any tool for it. There's plenty of free, you know, you could use Notion, you could use Google Drive, it doesn't have to be all that pretty. Um, but ensuring that that newcomer understands what worked for you, um, what may work for them, giving them the right tools, right, having a CRM, a really a properly documented and updated CRM is going to be hugely helpful for them, giving them the collateral they need to, to close deals. So, um, what are you using that's working, right? Um, I like to create uh, like instructional Loom videos and put that in our knowledge base. So um, you can give them sample demos that you've done that you think are successful um, to give them to, to have them sort of self-identify self what works and what doesn't. Um, I, it's, I think, it, I honestly, I think it's documentation first. Do you have a process clearly laid out for them? When they get on a call, what template are they using for their call notes? Um, are, do, you have a de do you have the deck for them? Do they know how to present the deck adequately? If you're doing, if it's more of a demo thing, make sure that you've trained them adequately on the demo. Um, is there things that you've learned like not doing a live demo and maybe just having your tabs of the different screens that you would normally show because there might be some quirks with Zoom eating up your browser's bandwidth. All of these little things, if you can de document them today, are going to make the transition a lot smoother. I've heard that from the folks that I'm passing a lot of this off on. Um, and then looking at the data, right? If, if you, um, I recommend, like, I have a spreadsheet, I call it the growth engine, and I look at how many calls, how many people click the call, book a call button, how many people booked a call, how many people we closed that month, 
um, and, and all sorts of other data. And I'm looking that on a month by month uh, process. And so when you're onboarding people, make sure, take a look, is your conversion rate taking a hit? Um, and try and identify why that may be, get ahead of those problems. Um, but I really think it is enabling the, the person that you're handing this off to with the right documentation um, and the past learnings from what you've learned as a founder um, selling your product. Thank you. And thanks, uh, Ryan, for the follow-up. And we can discuss more at length as well um, at the end, because this is a really interesting topic. Yes, thanks, Ryan. So that's that's a, a wrap again. Um, I wanted to just keep it high level and just go over um, my strategy and and hopefully answer more questions like Ryan's been asking about the tactics of some of these strategies. Um, I wanted to just like sort of uh, um, uh, collect all of the tools that I talked about and some maybe that I haven't that might be useful in your sales and growth strategies. So. Again, I use the Streak CRM. There's plenty of other CRMs out there. HubSpot has a really good startup program from what I understand. I do use Obi in my sales process. So with Obi, we have a browser extension and that's most popular for our client facing teams. And uh, there's actually a, fr a free version of Obi uh, for personal use that you can use. Um, and and what, I, what I do with Obi is um, in preparation for a call, I'll need I, I use a like a discovery call notes template. So I just ask Obi. My lights are going off. Um, oh. No worries. I think we're having a technical difficulty. Are you okay, Chris? Yeah, yeah. It's just because I haven't moved and no one's in here because it's six. A. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. I can still hear you. <laughs> fine. Okay, great. Oh, can you, you, can you not see me? No, no. Your camera just turned off. Oh, okay. Hang on a sec. It happens. No worries. I'll leave the camera off for now. That's okay. As long as you can hear me. We can hear you just fine. No worries. Great. Great. So, uh, yeah, so we use OB just to pull that collateral. So um, in preparation for a call, I'll, I will just ask OB for my discovery call notes template. With a click of a button, I can copy that into my the, the note section in my CRM. After the call, I use OB to pull up, uh, let's say a PDF on our annual pricing if the customers ask for that um, and pull the security information that they always ask for at the end of the call. So it's a great way of um, just pulling in all this, all this information from different sources that I might need to follow up with a prospect. Uh, we use PandaDoc which is really great free. They have a great freemium product for just like signing. It's like a DocuSign or a hello sign competitor. Um, so I use that in, um, in conjunction with the YC SAS agreement that I mentioned earlier. So if you don't already have a standard document, this works with any, like it doesn't have to be necessarily B2B. If you have to get into a, a legal agreement with any new customer, this is a really clean, like pre-vetted template that I use and a lot of companies use. And it's just so simple. It, it covers your bases. It gets you what you need. Um, and the customer, if they want amendments, they always come back and they send us the red line and we accept or deny the changes. Um, this may or may not be applicable to anyone, but if, if you are in sort of the software space or the B2B side of things, um, we use a pre-filled, they call it a CAKE, C-A-I-Q assessment. And it's it's been a godsend for us um, in lieu of some of the more expensive, arduous security authorizations that companies can have, like SOC 2, um, things like that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just ignore me. If, if you do, then you'll know that this is, this is going to be a hot button issue for you. Um, I mentioned Google Optimize for A-B testing on your website. Again, free tool, really, really handy for testing different pricing variants, um, different calls to action on your website, different value propositions and messaging. Super, super important. I use Calendly both sort of from a personal perspective, but it's also on our website. So if you go and you click book a call on our website, you'll see how we've actually been able to really bend the usage of Calendly. And so we've created this pretty robust um, funnel 
um, on our website using Calendly and it just does an automatic round robin and books a call with whoever's available at the time. Um, we use WordPress for our blog, as I mentioned. And then for some of the SEO uh, research, uh, you can use Ahrefs or SpyFu. Uh, both are fairly expensive, Ahrefs more so, but this is incredibly uh, powerful for doing your keyword research so you can ensure that the blogs that you're writing and the content that you're creating is actually um, going to drive uh, the appropriate traffic that you need. Um, and then on the framework and strategy side, I mentioned this concept of product market fit a lot. Um, hopefully most of you know what that means, um, but we've used, uh, it's been very, very, very successful for us, uh, the superhuman product market fit framework. So if you just Google that, you'll, you'll be able to find um, a framework of how the company superhuman, they're basically like a, a Gmail competitor um, uh, has gained tremendous success by using um, basically a survey that has three questions in it. Um, and if you're super early stage, I, I highly recommend that. Or if you haven't figured out product market fit yet. Uh, again, for us, channel partners work really well. And I, I was very, very high level on this. So if, if you want to talk about it, let me know. Uh, content marketing, as I mentioned, funnel optimization. Something that's super underrated is PR for startups. So I used to think that this was such a waste of time and money. Um, but if you can find the right partner, and I'm happy to make an introduction to our PR company, that's very affordable, believe it or not. Um, what I see, especially with early stage companies, PR being really good for it, is actually just taking it, taking the content that you're all, if you are investing in a content marketing strategy and distributing it in, 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 uh, in better ways than you than you could, or uh, making the most of your resources. So, taking you know guest posts that you would already have written on your blog and getting those um, published in, let's say, a top two, top tier three or tier two um, publication is you know is going to uh, affect your uh, domain authority um, positively um, uh, by doing those small little things. Um, I talked about BANT, which is just the, the discovery call sort of qualification framework that I use for sales, uh, and then uh, experiment doc. So I'm happy to send uh, Bridget my template for experiment documentation as well, which is super, super important for ensuring what you're doing and what you're testing as a startup um, is actually working. Um, so you can put your efforts towards things that uh, are going to move the needle rather than not. I hope that was helpful and effective. I know very high level in a lot of places. That's why I wanted to leave a good amount of time for Q&A so we can dig into things that uh, people want to dig into. Thank you, Chris. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, lots of great resources here. I was taking notes on a lot of, uh, a lot of what you were saying. Um, so I will open it up to uh, Q&A. So you've all been given the ability to um, to share, to, to unmute your mics. Um, so feel free if you'd like to ask some questions. Uh, don't be shy. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, even just to talk about maybe some challenges that you're experiencing, uh, maybe ask more about some of the platforms that Chris has mentioned, if yeah. you have questions about it. Um, I know uh, Ryan had some great questions in terms of, uh, you know, founder, uh, essentially mentorship. And, and I think that that's a huge piece of it. Um, so if anybody has any questions to follow up, we have some time for discussion. Uh, this session lasts typically till 11. Um, but you know, if we end a little early, that's okay. Um, you know, we can always, um, we can always uh, follow up as well. So uh, if you have any questions at this time, feel free to unmute your mic and ask. Don't be shy. Hey, Chris, it's Mark. Um, hey, Mark. I just wanted to ask, you know, it sounds like when you were, you know, going through the process, you, you know, at the beginning, you were kind of looking for anybody that could be a client and then you had your freemium right. model. And then, so, so how have you kind of redefined what your ideal client looks like? And then as you, you know, and, and then how are you refining it kind of going forward based on, 
based on the information you're getting, what you're collecting through your through your forms and through your demos and, and allowing you to, to, to target those companies either with content or with partners or those kind of things? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I'll try and be as succinct as possible. So you absolutely hit the nail on the head. Um, in the beginning, we were just, we would die for anyone to just get, you know, give us their credit card um, for what we had built. Um, and that was really the problem is that we were, building a product, not build it, building a solution for any one um, audience that really needed it. And so um, we were more focused on the fun of building this product, but it definitely was a, a product that um, solved the problem because there was dozens of other solutions out there competing with us. But um, obviously that's, that's never enough. You have to have some semblance of, of product market fit. Um, the way we figured that out was the first, first wave was once we realized we were just, you know, building the product for sake, sake of building a product, um, we, we, when we pivoted into OB recognizing that actually our value proposition was no good, we whipped up this landing page and we basically, I think we created some screenshots and some gifts of a product that didn't exist yet. It was very much like uh, you know, designed together and, and um, all just, you know, binary inputs to show what this new product could do. Um, and I think we took out like a, a small ad on Instagram or LinkedIn. We launched on Product Hunt um, and we just saw if anyone cared because in this previous iteration, no one seemed to, to care enough, at, at least for us to build a business on. Um, and that's when we we're able to validate by just getting emails. Um, and then from there, once we had a bunch of emails, we would send surveys asking them, Hey, what would you pay for this? Would, 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 would this be an interesting integration and so on and so forth. And that's how we sort of refined the, the minimum viable product of, of OB. Um, and then from there, um, we did make some mistakes in between, which is the sort of freemium um, uh, saga of our company. Um, and we definitely had a value proposition that resonated and the data suggested that because of all of the customers that we were, or the, sorry, the users that we were acquiring. Um, but then it was a, a shift in focus from, oh, hang on a second, we, we can't pay the bills, we can't keep the lights on with the freemium users. Um, especially because we hadn't raised a significant amount of money. So how do we then uh, turn these free users into pay user, paid users? Um, and, and for us, it was shifting the positioning and really figuring out, okay, what small subset of these many users and companies that have used OB for free are actually our core demographic and are going to be willing to pay for a product like this. And we did that, honestly, the thing that worked best for us was just turning off free and getting, forcing them to call, call us. Um, and first and foremost, it was just collecting some data on those people. So we had the for, foresight to, to collect who they were. So, you know, you're going to learn anecdotally by them, by doing a discovery call with them. Um, but better yet, you know, uh, marrying that with some actual real data. Um, so in the, like the call booking form, understanding what their, their use case was, asking them what their single greatest challenge is, um, how they solve this problem today, um, what size of company, what industry they're in. Um, and then, you know, over the process of, you know, whatever, six to 12 months, just continuing to refine that. And we start to see trends. Um, and then once st people start ponying up and giving you money, you can start to make um, some better judgment calls on, okay, who do we double down on here? I see that a lot of client facing teams are, are showing more interest than um, the engineering teams. Okay, great. Why? Let's ask them, let's ask them even more pointed questions in the discovery call process and refine and refine. And so um, in sort of the the last uh, quadrant of, of this exercise for us, it's been a lot of repositioning exercises. So um, obviously we have an easier time with it now because we have a little bit more data, um, 
we use like platforms like G2 to collect customer reviews. We've used the, um, the superhuman product market fit framework. I, I can't recommend that enough. It's not just for product. It's very much for positioning and how you're marketing uh, your product. Um, basically, it asks your users or your customers, um, how disappointed would you be if you could no longer use Obi? Very disappointed, somewhat disappointed, not disappointed. Um, if you could change one thing, what would it be? Um, and who do you think Obi is for? And basically what you do is you take all of the somewhat disappointed and what they say is the one thing you would change. Um, and you change that because the not disappointed, you've lost them. And the very disappointed are your advocates. And you want to look at the very disappointed and you want to see what they, who they say OB is for. Because um, most often, if they're qualified, they will self-identify. So like OB is great for salespeople looking for sales collateral and call notes and things like that. Um, and so that framework has been hugely, hugely successful. We've collected hundreds of, of, of those surveys from customers. Um, and you can do cohort analysis and start to see um, where you need to be moving your positioning. Um, we've learned through these exercises that uh, for better or for worse, we are big differentiator. The one, one of the most uh, reasons customers will uh, use Obi is because of our robust Slack integration. Um, and while that might be obvious, we didn't always double down on it because we didn't want to be dependent on that integration, but that feedback has, um, and that framework, um, has helped us position closer and closer to that integration. And it works um, because that's what people use OB for and that's what people are willing to pay for. So um, hopefully that's not overly confusing, but once you do those per, per, uh, positioning exercises, you can then translate that into your marketing, right? So who am I talking to? Like with a knowledge management product, it it applies to every company. Every company has this problem, but obviously we can't sell to every company because we can't be the best for uh, every company. We have so many different competitors. Um, and so we're really good with Slack enabled companies um, and client facing teams who use specific products like Google Drive and Confluence. Um, and so now we can start to cater our messaging to um, a few um that are going to be way more excited our, about our product than trying to be super broad about it and say, hey, if you have a problem finding information at work, come on in. Because then you get a whole wide array of, of people that are going to be, um, they don't have a hair on fire problem. Um, they have a, it's a sort of a nice to have for them. And so uh, that applies to obviously more than just OB and, and B2B SaaS companies. Um, but that's obviously some specific anecdotes and data from, from how we've done it. Great. Thank you. And thanks, Mark, for the question. And speaking of hair on fire problems, I know we said we weren't going to talk about 2020, um, <laughs> but uh, I'm curious, uh, due to the nature of uh, your product, uh, what challenges were you faced with last year or, or what opportunities presented themselves? Because I, I, I figure that you might have some very interesting insights in that area. Yeah, <clears throat> it was a... Uh a roller coaster of a year for us. So in, in March, we didn't know if it was going to help or hinder us. Um, we had in March, we had the highest amount of churn we've ever had in our company's history. And I think we had the highest amount of uh, customers one. Um, yeah. And so obviously the churn is the customers that, you know, Oh, oh crap. We just lost our, our whole market. Like we had customers mm -hmm. in the oil and gas industry and things like that. Um, uh, and then obviously the customers that uh, we acquired were like, oh crap, this remote thing, um, we have to enable our, 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 our teams. Yeah. Um, but then it was silent for <laughs> almost all of Q2 and Q3. It was very painful um, because yeah. before that we were on a really good trajectory. Um, and thankfully Q4 and the start of this year have been just uh, record breaking busy 
And um, I think what's happened, just looking at the data, is there was a bit of a, a delayed response in the market where mm -hmm. early on, the middle of, of 2020, companies weren't sure uh, if remote was going to stay, mm -hmm. if, um, you know, what, what that really meant for them. Uh, also, there was probably a delayed reaction in the problem um, uh that sort of remote work and distributed work exasperates that OB solves. Yeah. Um, and so I think at the end of the year and starting in going into this year, we're seeing that now a delayed response um, where people are saying, okay, well now our company has an official remote work policy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're, we're investing in this, we're doubling down on this strategy. Um, and Hey, by the way, now no one self services, the solution to everyone's problem is just sending a message into a Slack channel and hoping one of my colleagues answers. And, and that's a problem that OB solves uh, beautifully. So um, net positive for us overall, um, mm. but uh, it's been interesting. It certainly has been a challenging year. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, but it's great to know that, uh, you know, through throughout that you were able to find opportunity and pivot where needed. Um, so yeah, no, thank you so much. Like a lot of amazing insights. Uh, I really love, uh, you know, the, the experimentation doc and, and what you're saying about all the, the little ways in which you drill down. Um, I, I think that's so valuable and, and very savvy. Um, I see Ryan has his hand up. Um, so Ryan, um, actually, if you want to unmute yourself, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, sure. Hey, Chris, congratulations on all your perseverance and getting to where you are. That's awesome. Uh, well Thanks, done. Ryan. Um, quick question. Uh, I was wondering, because you, you mentioned top of funnel as like a problem or something like obviously an area of focus. Like yeah. What are you currently doing, um, you know, to increase the leads at the top of your funnel? And uh, like, what are your, you know, what are the current things that you're working on? Or maybe what you're, um, what you're looking ahead to as well, things that you um, plan to work on to increase the top of the funnel? Yeah, good question. Um, so we are doubling down on our content marketing strategy because it's it's working finally um more than that though is uh, sort of just uh grassroots paid acquisition hasn't been all that successful but what has been has been retargeting so picking some of our more successful content um and then retargeting folks that land on that content on the channels in which they're a little bit more engaged on um, so those are things we're doubling down on. Um, yeah, there's some specifics like things that have worked that, you know, are just, were just experiments at the beginning. So, um, we, we started writing these comparison blogs where we're in a, we're in an, uh, an industry where there's so much competition. And, um, so we like wrote, uh, the best Slack wiki blog and like a uh, comparison of like the top, uh, Slack enabled service desk blogs and things like that. Um, those work organically. They work as sales collateral. If you're talking to a customer that's evaluating other prospects um, and they also work as paid content. So Google ad, uh, AdWords and things like that. Um, other things that we're trying though is, uh, God, I mean, we've tried every other paid acquisition channel, not overly successful for us. We are working on new partnerships. So new free channels of distribution. Uh, we're working on some stuff with Microsoft and some stuff with Salesforce. Um, so those would be obviously product integrations, but then being on their like exchanges, their app stores will drive new traffic to OB. Uh, we've also done a, a bunch of outbound email um, marketing, you know, like the standard, like five email cadence type of thing. What's interesting is that has driven a ton of traffic to the site. It hasn't converted yet. So we're sort of pressing pause on that and seeing if there's a lag. And this is probably applicable for a lot of companies. Um, the challenge with OB is, is finding a prospect when they are in the right buyer journey, stage of the buyer journey. Uh, OB isn't a solution that you can sell to someone six months early. They have to really have found, felt that problem um, and prioritized, uh, you know, doing something about it. And so outbound email is, uh, is something we're still trying and, and testing. 
um, unclear if whether or not it's it's going to scale. Um, uh, at the very least, I think it helps just sort of brand recognition, especially in a in a crowded space. Um, but I think uh, leveraging our content strategy, leveraging our channel partners and our SEO stuff, um, I think the goal will be to, um, once we uh, gain sort of an exponential um, inflection point of those leads coming in, it'll just be a matter of ramping up the, the bottom, um, hiring some um, SDRs or AEs to close those deals. We might try like a, a BDR model where we can get, uh, have people do their own outbound, like more prospecting. Um, but I'd like it to be more inbound if possible. Um, OB has a fairly aggressive price point. So, um, making sure we're making money on every deal is, 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 a, is a, a challenge in and itself. So those are the things that, uh, we're thinking of. Amazing. Sounds like you've got the 2021 planned out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, any follow-up questions or comments, Ryan? No, that was, well, I guess, yeah, that was really interesting. I think there's a lot of commonalities, uh, that I have with, uh, with your approach, but interested to know a little bit, like, I don't know if you can speak more to outbound. Um, I know that that was something that you said that you've tried, um, email or, or otherwise. Yeah, both, I guess. Like, have you brought in anyone particular, like, have you brought in anyone, uh, like with a specific focus on outbound sales? Uh, or have you done that internally? And, and, uh, yeah, maybe if you can talk about the email too, like, I was just wondering, like, how do you, how do you, um, uh, where do you get your list from your email list? Uh, are you doing, you know, and, uh, and maybe some more specifics around that. So either or, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we've done both. We've done it internally and we, we are currently still, I haven't fired them yet. We're, we're outsourcing part of it. Um, not because we couldn't do it internally, but just because we are still a really small lean team. Um, resort, like our, our resources are just so finite. Um, um, so doing it internally, uh, like streak has the CRM that I use has like an outbound feature where you can set a cadence. Um, we get, get some of those leads from G2. Um, uh, and just folks that have, have reached out to us. Um, I don't really love the G2 data. Um, and we've also done some just great, you know, boots on the ground prospecting using LinkedIn. Um, and you know, we have some fairly clearly defined ICPs where we can say, okay, we're looking at customers, 250 employees plus, um, we're looking at, you know, director of customer success, things like that. And then we just try and find them and build the list within our CRM. The, the problem with that is just so time consuming. And if you really don't know if it's going to work, uh, it's, it's costly. So what we did last year is we decided to use this company, uh, called personas and they basically do it for us. Like they're not br breaking any ground or anything, but they acquire the list. Um, I don't, they don't get it from zoom info, but you can get a list from zoom info. Um, and then they, they have some unique way of like cross, um, referencing it with, uh, I forget what the, there's some other like data sources that if you know some other qualification criteria about your prospect, like for us, <clears throat> we want to target G suite organizations. That's something very, very unique and specific. Um, and that's like data that they can actually pull. So then they'll whittle down the list that they got from probably some other aggregate system. Um, and then they put it into outreach. If you're familiar with that tool, um, and run the cadences that way. And they send it on behalf of like me and, and our other growth people. And then we just reply. So like they literally manage the whole process, uh, from that, like I said, it's, it's been effective in that we've embedded some like dumb links into those cadences, um, uh, as calls to action and a ton of people have clicked it and got to our website, but, uh, we've done a few demos. I don't think we've clo closed anything from it yet, 
Um, but uh, that's where the retargeting comes in. So we figured out that so many people are coming to the website, fairly qualified traffic. So at the very least, we can then hit them with the retargeting. Um, and because the chances are when they get that email, they're not in a buying position. So um, we're fairly optimistic that we should see some start stuff trickle in, um, you know, over the next couple of quarters now that we're on some of these people's radars, but um, jury, the jury is still out. Um, if you can do it internally um, at some sort of scale and just test your theory, um, at the very least, it's good for, uh, it's an alternative to the, the product market fit framework for just testing your positioning, um, sort of to Mark's point, is you can test different subject lines and you, it's you know, pretty data-driven. How many people did you get to open that email versus the next? Um, how many clicks did you get on that email versus the last? Um, how many replies and, and, and so forth. But e email is tricky in 2021. It's um, spam filters are against you. Angry people are against you. Um, so it, it's tough. Okay, thank you for that. Um, any follow-up, Brian? Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it's cool. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to ask ask a question so yeah, no, that's <laughs> okay. be great, that's to, okay. Follow, yeah, be great <laughs> to follow up after this so yeah absolutely and and on that note if anybody you know ha wants to connect with uh with chris afterwards i'm happy to to connect you if you have some follow-up questions um you know i think i think learning from our peers is is so invaluable and and you know uh it, it, it's it's timely. So uh, I think, you know, if you have the opportunity to, to talk with other folks who are going through the same challenges and opportunities, um, please um, take the opportunity. And I see that Ryan says, thanks for the response. I especially like the transparent responses. I did too. And um, Chris, it would be great to catch up after this. We have lots of commonality. So Ryan, I'm happy to connect you with, uh, with Chris and um, you guys can chat. My pleasure. Yeah, and connect after this. So um, if there are other questions, please feel free to unmute your mic and just jump in. Um, if not, uh, I will uh, end it shortly and thank everybody for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, we know you're all busy and have lots to do. So we really appreciate you taking the time to join in. Um, I will be sharing the recording with the attendees as well as any of the links that uh, Chris provides. So Chris, if you wanna email me any anything that you think would be relevant, interesting, if, if you're willing to share your deck or an amended version, any of those assets, I'm happy to share. Um, and again, if you'd like to be connected, I'm happy to make a warm introduction. Um, but on that note, I would like to thank you, Chris, for taking the time out of your day to join us today and share your insights. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for, to Mark uh, on the back end there for uh, helping us set this up. So uh, Chris is joining us from uh, the West Coast uh, today. So um, yeah, you know, thank you for, for, for taking the time as well to join us. Uh, so if there My are pleasure. no further questions, um, I will close out here and I will be uh, following up a little bit later today. So thank you everybody for joining us. Chris, I have one co co a question slash comment, um, yeah. but, and we can do it, we can do it offline. Um, I don't know if you've looked at the, you know, with Slack being purchased, I don't know if you've looked at the um, Salesforce infrastructure and community, you know, from, um, um, but I'm, I did some work with a Canadian company that got bought, bought twice and uh, has, was on the Salesforce platform. So I'm happy to share some what of What was the, what was the company, if you don't mind me asking? Um, so eventually it was a uh, form stack. It was a visual antidote. Um, so form stack was got bought, but it was the, the, the parent was a company called visual antidote. And they were okay. based in Toronto and they had a, a forum tool. So they actually, <clears throat> they, uh, they got bought by um, a company. Then that, that company got purchased, but uh, and consolidated a number of um, different companies together, including they bought another Canadian company as well. So, um, so I, I'd spent yeah. a couple of years looking at uh, working on the Salesforce with the sales with Salesforce and the community. So I, I'm happy to give you a few, you know, insights and lessons learned over that. That cool. Yeah. Time. It's something that we're prioritizing this year. Um, I think uh, the announcement helps uh, because it shows us that, 
yeah, we've, we've heavily invested in Slack, which is, it's like Slack or Microsoft. And we always get criticized for not being on uh, Microsoft, but um, the challenge with us is we're still a lean team. And um, to, to do that integration, we would have to support the entire ecosystem. So it actually makes sense for us to do Salesforce before going to Microsoft um, because it's our, like with the, the acquisition now it's, it's just a bolt on basically of existing um, integrations we already have. So yeah, love any insight on the, on the partnership side there. I know they're like the pioneers of the app exchange. So um, I know that there's a huge opportunity over there if we can get together an interesting integration. Yeah, and I think that the opportunity there as well is they have a really well well built out and loyal community that's very that can be yeah. very focused on like you can find the partners that suit your ideal client. Like that's they're very like the partner community is typically pretty focused too. And um, and um, so yeah, I think you know, and so is internally they're structured on verticals and geographies and size of companies. Right. So it makes it challenging to navigate. But the nice thing is if you can get to the right right folks is that you can, you know, it can be an opportunity, you know, again, it's, yep. it's a bit of a slow, slow game as well. You need to get, find the champions and get on board, but it can, it can have, you know, again, drive more, more qualified inbound leads. So. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. I'd love any insight that you have. Okay. So maybe I'll send you a message on LinkedIn and we can find it okay. to, to talk about that. So. That'd be great. Thanks, Mark. We're going to keep you busy, Chris. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Thank you for, for that question, Mark. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm happy you guys will connect afterwards and I'll make sure to connect you with Ryan and anyone else who would like to get connected. Um, so yeah, so are there any other questions at this time? Okay, I think we're good. Uh, okay, so thank you so much, Chris, again. And thank you, Mark. And thank you, everybody, for joining in. Um, and I really look forward to see seeing what you do this year and, and how things progress. And we'll make sure to stay in touch so that we know um, how we can further help. And uh, also, uh, you know, uh, make sure to share your, your wonderful uh, successes with uh, the rest of our ecosystem. So Thanks thank so you. much, Bridget. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Thank Thanks, you, everyone, for, uh, for having me. Yes. Have a wonderful rest of the day. I'll be in touch later on. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye.